Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm John Richardson. I'm um, State Director of the Victorian Office of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the State Library of Victoria, who have very graciously joined us in partnering and uh, making available this splendid venue. We have a very distinguished uh, audience uh, here tonight for this evening's conversation, including from uh, the uh, State Department, uh, welcome, uh, 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 from the State Government, uh, we're delighted to see you here, from uh, the Consular Corps, uh, the Consul General of uh, Spain, uh, the Honorary Consul General of Malawi, and of course, senior members of the Consulate of uh, China. We have uh, senior academics here, uh, the Vice Chancellor of Deakin University, Dr. Jane von Hollander. Uh, we also have uh, from the state government, from business, from the cultural community, from many other areas. And so I'd like to welcome you here tonight uh, to this conversation. But most particularly, I want to invite, uh, to welcome our two key guests, the, our two speakers. Her Excellency Frances Adamson, Australia's ambassador to China, and the ABC's Jim Middleton. Before I ask them to come up here, I'd like to just explain that they will have a conversation for 40 minutes or so, and then it will be open uh, to questions and comments from the audience, though I would ask you to keep those questions uh, short. We will have two roving microphones uh, to make it easier to communicate, and I should also note that we will actually be recording uh, tonight's uh, session. So, it is my particular pleasure to welcome our panelists um, up onto the stage. Now, many of you will know Jim Middleton. Uh, Jim is a very senior figure in the ABC. He is chief presenter of the world and the world this week on ABC television and a veteran ABC reporter. In fact, since Kerry O'Brien left the ABC, he could rightly claim to be not only the doyen of the <laughs> ABC media team, but I would argue of the electronic media in Australia. He joined the ABC in 1970. His four decades as a correspondent has centered on political and international reporting. From 1988 until uh, 2007, Mr. Middleton was the ABC TV's political editor in Canberra, covering several seven federal elections as he reported the Howard, Keating, and Hawke governments. And in that role, he also reported throughout Asia, Europe, and the Americas. And he has been traveling to and traveling in China for over 25 years. So who better to act as a moderator for this evening's conversation with Her Excellency Frances Adamson, our ambassador to China. Jim, welcome. Thank you very much, John. I'm not sure that it's uh, entirely uh, kind to be reminded just how old one is, but thank you very much. The Chinese respect experience and age, so perhaps it's not such a bad thing after all. We are very lucky to have here tonight a, a, a distinguished, one of the most distinguished and experienced of Australian diplomats, and I think the roll-up uh, the turnout that there is uh, reflects uh, just that. Frances Adamson has been uh, travelling to and working in and around China for even longer than I've been visiting. So from the mid-1980s, from uh, the late 1980s, she served as uh, in the Australian Consulate General in Hong Kong. Uh, she has also served in the Australian Office uh, in Taipei in the early years of this century and she has also had two uh, terms at the very top uh, end of uh, uh, Australia's representation at the Australian High Commission in London. Since uh, in 
just over, just under three years ago, she was appointed Australian uh, ambassador to China. And uh, in that very short period, uh, she has visited not just Beijing and Shanghai and the other big centres, but 27 of, uh, of, of China's 31 provinces, which is a reminder not only that China is so much bigger than just those cities of which we see so much, but also of the importance to, of what happens outside those main centres to Australia's relations uh, with, uh, with, with China. And uh, various Australian leaders have reminded us of that over the years too. Ms Adamson is also the uh, honorary patron of the China-Australia Chamber of Commerce in Beijing, patron of the Australia-China Alumni Association, member of the advisory board of the Australian National University's Australian Centre on China in the World, and an ex-officio member of the Leadership Council of the Australia-China Youth Dialogue. What a well-rounded CV that is, Francis. But let's get on with it. Uh, let's start with the China dream, which seems like a simple advertising slogan. Xi Jinping has been using it pretty much and pretty frequently uh, ever since he won the top job and took the top job back at the end of 2012. He's described it as national rejuvenation, improvement of people's livelihoods, prosperity, construction of a better country and military strengthening. That seems to cover just about all bases. He's also said young people should dare to dream, work assiduously to fulfil the dream and contribute to the revitalisation of the nation. Sounds like something an Australian Prime Minister could be telling our young people, but there you go. What is the China dream? Why is it, and what is its significance, particularly under the leadership of Xi Jinping? Well, Jim, I think that the answer to those questions is still <clears throat> in the process of being formulated. But certainly from the moment Xi Jinping, and you mentioned this, from the moment he became or he was announced to the world as uh, General Secretary of the Communist Party of China and he walked out onto a stage a bit like this one and then he addressed the world's media and one of the first things he spoke about was the China dream, uh, the, the re revival, the rejuvenation, the great revival in fact of the Chinese nation. And he subsequently, in fact, quite quickly started to develop the idea. I think many of us could see the instant attraction. And his predecessors as, as General Secretary have, uh, over the decades, themselves adopted uh, slogans or ideas which they've, around which they've sought to craft their leadership. But I think with Xi, he was very quickly, it was within a week or two, uh, into the uh, Museum of China, the National Museum of China on Tiananmen Square, a number of you may have been, uh, in, into a particular hall called the Rejuvenation Hall. And there he stood with fellow uh, standing committee members. They were all wearing the sort of bomber jackets. When the standing committee goes on an excursion, as it were, they tend to dress the same. They were wearing bomber jackets and they all stood uh, in the hall, which shows you know, paintings and photographs of uh, the period during which China was um, uh, a sort of century of humiliation as they describe it and the coming out of all of that. And he started to expand on the idea then and he listed amongst the, the, the aspects of it, he, he said exactly what you've said uh, in terms of, of rejuvenation, of revival of the nation and that reflects I think China's view of its own civilization. Uh, its view of that period of humiliation and the need for revival. But he also spoke about the need to bring uh, the party closer to the people, uh, to uh, uh, crack down on corruption, which has been one of his significant uh, reforms, uh, and also to engage in the kind of economic reform that would realise for individuals the sorts of things that play well in our politics too. Um, uh, increased incomes, better social safety nets, better health system, better education. So already he was drawing a link, if you like, between the national level goals and the personal ones. And they've been quickly backed up by 
what one either calls uh, you know, publicity or propaganda, depending on one's point of view, around Beijing. And in fact, in virtually now every city in China, instead of those big character posters, a, a red background and white letters entreating people to advance the nation or develop the economy or do various things, there are now beautiful what you would call folk art posters with a series of slogans written in very nice calligraphy and one of them is Zhongguomeng, Wodemeng and that is China's dream, my dream and there's a beautiful little girl in a, in a um, folk art type uh, pose um, and it's designed to appeal. There's one fairly near the Australian Embassy actually as I walk past it I reflect on what this means for the average Chinese person. Now, it can, these things can mean a lot or not very much. Uh, and I think we're in the process of seeing, will Xi Jinping be able to deliver elements of this China dream enough to uh, result, I guess, in continuing even greater, from his point of view, support for the Communist Party? So there's a question, but in terms of the politics of it, the sophistication of the politics, it's quite sophisticated and, in fact, uh, an international public relations company re recently took a, uh, an opinion poll in the United States around recognition of the American dream, a poll in China, recognition of the China dream, uh, and our audience will know instinctively that the China dream had a higher recognition rate in China than the American dream in America. I remember that initial speech when I was in Beijing when he was installed and what struck me about it in trying to envelop this in the China dream was on the one hand you had this assertion of the need for economic and political reform but on the other hand a quite clear nationalism as well. And I think it's fair to say that in the period since then China's nationalism has been more assertive than we have seen in in, 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 in previous years and what I'm wondering is whether you think that he needs uh, this assertiveness to provide him with the cover as it were to enable him to not alienate people for the fairly difficult economic and political reforms that are required if China is, its prosperity is to be guaranteed into the future. Mm. Well, as you know, um, that, that's certainly a strain of, of argument. Uh, there are many people uh, who make it their business to watch China, both from within and from without, uh, scholars and, and others, uh, journalists, commentators, diplomats. And this is a, a key question to which I'm not sure that there is yet an easy answer. I mean, it's certainly the case that uh, for those of us who live and work in China, and I'm sure a number of you will have visited, there is a, a sense in China that China's time is coming. Uh, there's no, to my mind anyway, there is not a great deal of, of arrogance about that or a presumption because there's still a, very, a lot of hard work to be done. But it is also obviously clear that China under President Xi's leadership is pursuing uh, a foreign policy which, was, which is active. Some would describe it as assertive. Some would use perhaps even stronger adjectives to, decide, to describe it. It is certainly the case also that he is implementing or embarked upon implementing a very ambitious reform program for which there is not universal support. As with any reform program in any society, including ours, there will be people who uh, will regard themselves as beneficiaries of reform. Uh, as, and that was clearly the case in the late 1970s when Deng Xiaoping embarked on the first wave of economic reform it was almost universally the case that everyone benefited from this. With this new wave of reform, and economists are indeed calling it a new wave, I think there's uh, a much greater sense that there will be beneficiaries, there will be winners, but there will also be losers. Uh, so one can easily make the argument, the need to uh, be strong externally in order to build support internally. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't personally subscribe wholly to that, because I think uh, even with successful reforms and even with support uh, for those reforms, uh, China is simply growing in size, growing in confidence and taking what it assumes to be its rightful place in our region and indeed globally. Is it genuinely possible, do you think, for the Communist Party to maintain 
its paramount role and at the same time to engage in the kind of economic reforms that will satisfy in particular the middle class but also those that billion, uh, the hundreds of millions of people who have been brought out of rural poverty into, into greater wealth uh, within uh, China's cities. Well, I mean, that is the, the unspoken, often actually a, an explicit bargain, if you like, between the Communist Party and the people uh, in exchange for continuing support of a, of a one-party state. Uh, the Chinese people are delivered by their leaders uh, continuing economic reform from which they all uh, benefit. And, and obviously, China now has a very large number of billionaires who've clearly benefited. But it also has, as you said, you know, hundreds of millions of people who've come from rural areas, come from the countryside into the cities. In doing so, they typically become three times more productive in uh, manufacturing jobs uh, and levels of income rise. And that's been uh, the, the process, if you like, since the late 1970s. The question, does the party have the ability to continue to garner that sort of support? I think that's one of the drivers of this uh, period of new period of reform. But I think Xi Jinping clearly recognises and has said explicitly uh, that the party needs to get closer to the people. And that explains his uh, crackdown on corruption. Uh, it also explains what is a, an austerity drive across uh, the party and involving government officials too. Uh, no longer acceptable to have expensive banquets with um, large quantities of expensive Australian wine. Things need to be done in a more, uh, more down-to-earth fashion, in a, in a fashion that would meet with the approval of the people. And that's clearly had an impact uh, not just on Australian wine, but on the, the imports uh, into China of, of uh, luxury cars, of luxury goods, even of, of sales of their own luxury products. So there is an austerity drive underway. Uh, I mean, it, Banquets uh, in the past have had eight to possibly 12 courses. Uh, President Xi has entreated party members as they travel around the country to take their own lunch with them or at, at a maximum to, uh, to have uh, four dishes and a soup. Uh, so that encapsulates, if you like, uh, what it is that he's talking about. And not surprisingly, this has had some impact. It's got widespread support, certainly amongst the general populace, if not amongst officials themselves. Beyond these uh, symbols, and symbols are always important in, in politics, but beyond the symbols, do you think that he actually has, uh, are the signs, I should put it this way, that he has sufficient support within the party <laughs> to carry through his promises as far as corruption uh, at the highest levels? We've seen some notable developments in that regard, even in recent days. Uh, but is there any sign of a kickback against that? Or, or do you think that at this stage, the signs are good, propitious, that he will be able to, to carry through what clearly is an important measure to, to, to retain the confidence of the people as well into the future? Again, that's a very good question. I think part of it goes, part of the answer goes to uh, Xi Jinping's own power as a leader. Now, he's been a general secretary for uh, just over 18 months. I think he's widely uh, acknowledged within China and, and uh, outside as having, uh, to use the, the sort of term of art, consolidated his power uh, more quickly and I think probably more comprehensively that, men, that many people would have expected of a new Chinese leader. I mean, typically, they, they uh, come to power with a five-year term, uh, in recent years anyway, to be followed by a second five-year term. And the expectation is that he will be general secretary and president and chairman of the Central Military Commission, the three main uh, centres of power, for 10 years. To have reached the stage that he has after only 18 or 19 months, uh, people reckon is uh, he, that he is going to be a powerful leader. In fact, many people are already saying that Xi Jinping is China's most powerful leader since Deng Xiaoping. Uh, 
I personally think it's a little early to be as definitive uh, about this as some people are prepared to do. I think what we see though is uh, the fact that he's not only got those three titles but taken on additional roles as, sen sensor, as, as head sorry, of, a, of a new uh, National Security Commission, uh, taking control of leading small groups on implementing reform and, and on the internet and various other things. That tells me that these reforms are very complex, there are vested interests ranged against them, that he needs to have his hand on every lever, every lever of power uh, to make it work. Uh, but the crackdown on corruption is clearly not just about corruption, it's also about, uh, I think uh, there's no sort of beating about the bush on this, it's about uh, removing uh, from uh, positions of, of authority and power uh, people who would uh, be likely to oppose what he's doing. Now we don't, the Chinese system is quite opaque when it comes to these important questions it's very difficult for us really to see what is going on, but the signs so far are, very, are, are I think, positive ones, encouraging ones for Xi himself. But we've just been through the, uh, late last year, the third plenum uh, of the uh, 18th Central Committee of the, of the party. That was the, typically the economic reform plenum. The fourth plenum, uh, the next big meeting of the Central Committee, uh, will be held before the end of this year. Uh, increasingly people are thinking it might, might be held earlier than the traditional October or November. Uh, this plenum is typically a what is described as a party building plenum and I think the broad expectation is that Xi Jinping will use this meeting, this important meeting of the Central Committee with just over 200 senior members of the party to really, um, uh, I suppose, coalesce support for what he then needs to do for the next phase of reform. And there may well be some particular decisions that come out of that. This goes to key personalities and, and uh, people f for whom the, the, the sort of corruption, the party corruption charge may well prove a, a sort of career ending phase, if I can put it that way. Yes, the, uh, the Borgi Lai faction, if I, there are still people within the structure who are really quite powerful in that regard. Look, I, I, I would like to get on to uh, Australia-China relations I shortly, but if before we get to that, I, I would talk a bit further about uh, foreign policy, if I may. Uh, the assertiveness that we have seen uh, in the early Xi years, in particular about uh, territorial, territorial disputes, the South and East uh, China Seas, uh, moving oil rigs off Vietnam, uh, declaration of air identification uh, zones uh, with, uh, in relation to the Daiyu Senkaku Islands. We're seeing some uh, reaction to that in some way or other with the Japanese announcement of yesterday about uh, reinterpretation of its constitution, uh, which allows for a more assertive uh, uh, security stance on the part of the Japanese as well. How worried should we be about these developments in North Asia? Is there a danger from the Australian government's perspective of this getting out of control? Let me just come back uh, straight away on an important point about Japan. Uh, what uh, was announced yesterday in Tokyo was, uh, you rightly describe it as a reinterpretation of the constitution. We couldn't get the constitutional to in, to change through enable, the To <laughs> enable uh, Japan to exercise the right that every country has under the United Nations Charter for collective self-defence. So I think this is something, this is absolutely something that the Australian government welcomes. Uh, we, we see uh, a role for Japan in, in assuming the responsibilities of a normal country given uh, its um, uh, history since the Second World War. So it's really about, I mean, I, I really would, would never use the words, and you, uh, you, will, n you will not hear uh, uh, any Australian leader use the words a more assertive Japan. What this simply does is uh, enable what it will do if accepted domestically in Japan, and that's really a decision for them to exercise its UN, right under the UN Charter, it's the only country which has chosen not to uh, be able to exercise that right, to exercise collective self-defense. It's a very different thing from an assertive 
uh, foreign policy. Is this something that we need to be worried about? Should Australia be worried about what's happening in the South China Sea and the East China Sea? Well, in as much as uh, tension between countries in the region, uh, differences uh, over uh, interpretations of territorial claims, in as much as they drive um, uh, tension, uh, create uncertainty, create risks for risks of unintended consequences of <coughs> planes flying too close together, of of an incident at sea, or of a what we what diplomats call a miscalculation, then certainly we should be, because obviously uh, as the economic and and strategic weight globally shifts to the Asia Pacific region. Uh, this is creating uh, uh, a, new, a, a new period, a period of transition when countries are seeking to assert rights, which in the case of China and many others in the region, they have asserted for, they would argue at least, uh, hundreds of years. In China's case, we go back to the Song Dynasty for some of their territorial claims. But I think, uh, I mean, the, the uh, pages of the editorial pages of the Australian uh, over the last month or so have hosted a lively debate between the ambassadors of um, Japan, uh, Korea, South, South Korea and China, each of them setting out their own country's view of uh, their territorial claims and why they are without reproach. Uh, and having read each one of these, I am you know, briefly persuaded by each ambassador as I read it, but I know <laughs> that they don't add up. So there's an element of staking a claim of reasserting um, a right. What it really, the important thing for Australia is how all of this is managed, how the countries directly affected themselves manage it. And there are many overlapping claims around the Paracel Islands, the Spratly Islands in the South China Sea. It's immensely complicated. It's the Australian government's policy that we don't take a position on individual claims, but we're very quick to, to speak out against action which serves to increase tensions, uh, certainly any coercive be action on the part of any party uh, which is designed to change the status quo. So we should be knowledgeable about this, we should have a view on this, uh, we should certainly be supportive of any actions which um, provide mechanisms to, to manage unintended consequences and the the ASEAN countries, the Association of Southeast Asian Nation countries and China have for some time been negotiating a code of conduct in the South China Sea. We, we obviously actively support that diplomacy because it will uh, provide a, a clearer framework for how to handle these things. For the last decade, uh, Australian, foreign, uh, Australian security policy in relation to China and the United States has been uh, followed what I sometimes term the Howard Doctrine, that is that Australia does not need to choose between its main economic partner and its chief and most important ally. Over recent months, not so much this year, but in the latter part of last year, I detected a certain degree of frustration whenever I talked about this with Chinese officials and opinion leaders. Is this something that you have any difficulty in explaining to uh, the Chinese government if and when it comes up in your discussions, your frequent discussions with them in Beijing? Look, it's not, to be honest, it's not something that I have difficulty uh, explaining. I mean, we... Australia or that they have any difficulty well, I mean, accepting. Look, it, it's uh, not really, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a sort of construct which is um, of interest in, uh, I've got to be very, choose my words very carefully here, <laughs> amongst uh, uh, authors and commentators and, and in universities. In, in practical terms though, Australia has, <coughs> over the last 42 years of our diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, we've been building a, a comprehensive relationship, a, a, a constructive and cooperative partnership across a whole range of areas. It's not simply a, um, a balance sheet with dollars in each direction for our trade and investment. It's a, uh, we have certainly some economic complementarities, but if you were to measure the totality of our relationship, it's, it's very much more than that. In Australia, we naturally emphasise China as our largest trading partner, but 
look, looking at it from a Chinese perspective, Australia is a very important partner. We supply over 50% of their iron ore, for example, a significant proportion of their imported uh, liquefied natural gas, coal, copper, gold. Um, the commodities part of the story is very well known, but increasingly conversations with Chinese will have them acknowledge and speak about the value of the people to people uh, aspect of our relationship, the number of Chinese students who study in Australia, the number of tourists who visit, the uh, partnerships between our universities, the, the research aspects of those, uh, the cultural dimension, the work that we do together over the last two years in the United Nations Security Council where Australia has been a, a non-permanent member and of course China is a permanent member. The work we do together in regional organisations such as a the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Forum. China's hosting that, uh, that uh, leaders meeting in November. Australia's played a leading role in the G20 and we're hosting the G20 leaders meeting uh, in November as well too. We have a, a strategic partnership uh, agreed during Prime Minister Gillard's visit to China last year. So, you know, the, the Australia-China relationship and our cooperation regionally and globally uh, is a very sort of full conversation. The Chinese understand that we are an alliance partner of the United States. You know, they respect that. Um, uh, in some respects, I think it makes us more interesting to them. Uh, they don't necessarily like absolutely everything we do uh, in connection with that partnership, but they don't expect to either. So when it comes to, you know, the big choice, one over the other, I really think that's a, a false dichotomy. I mean, there are a whole range of choices that Australia makes, decisions that we make in our national interest across many relationships. China is one of them, the United States is one of them, but they're the complexities of, of diplomacy, um, and as a diplomat, they are challenges that, that I relish, so do my colleagues, and certainly uh, government ministers and the Prime Minister do. You talked about people-to-people uh, -people relations, uh, education, tourism, for example. China is now takes fully one-third, even a bit more, of our exports. It is hugely important to our future. but. Do you think, uh, perhaps, that the cultural default position of Australia is still too often Washington, New York and London? Has it caught up with the reality of just how significant uh, this country is to us? There's always more that we can do, of course, <coughs> but you mentioned uh, when you uh, kindly introduced me that I'd had two postings at the Australian High Commission in London in the 1990s, uh, in the mid-2000, 2005, 2009. So I have a sense of uh, how a relationship where we know each other sometimes almost too well, how all of that functions. Uh, and it's actually been an interesting reference point for me in relation to China, which has been another <coughs> career anchor for me. I think you mentioned that I first visited in 1987. I was in Hong Kong uh, in the late 1980s in, in Taiwan in the early thousands. And I've seen uh, during that period, over the last 25 years, but even over the last three, uh, a much greater awareness uh, across Australia of what is at stake in the China relationship, uh, a willingness. I mean, some people have been, been visiting their whole lives. Uh, and, and yet every, you know, we very regularly get uh, school groups coming in. In fact, Victoria has a program of bringing significant numbers of year nine students to China each year. So I see young uh, students making their very first visit to China and in between there's every sort of gradation of knowing China or being introduced to it. I've, mean, I've made a, a thing, if you like, as ambassador and in many respects, this is my predecessors have, of encouraging uh, people in Australia who are likely to find themselves in a decision-making role in relation to every, any aspect of Australia's relations with China, whether they're uh, business people, vice chancellors, heads of chambers of commerce, ministers, premiers, um, uh, members of the Australian Defence Force, uh, diplomats, uh, to know China before they come to those positions of, of authority and decision making, because there are aspects of it which are not uh, easy to grasp without a, 
the understanding and the level of comfort which comes uh, with visits. But I think we're actually doing not a bad job of all of that. I think across, uh, and I've, in the last two weeks, I will have visited every Australian state and territory. Uh, everyone's got plans and strategies that make considerable sense, I think, and that we're implementing. It's not to say we couldn't do more. It's not to say that uh, we don't need to do a lot more of this, but I think we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves about how well we're doing at the moment. From my perspective, it's very encouraging. There's a huge amount to work with. And my, I've sort of approached my term as ambassador, if you like, in a, in, in a um, uh, deliberately, overtly inclusive way because there are so many people, many of them no doubt in tonight's audience, who have a stake in the relationship with China and have a genuine interest in, in deepening and broadening it. I will throw this open to your questions, of which I'm sure there are many, but before I do, just one further question. I mentioned at the beginning that you had visited uh, in under three years uh, all but four of the 31 provinces uh, in China, and as you have said to me, you will go as ambassador wherever you are needed. Why, why is it important for Australia to understand that there is more to China than the big cities of Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou? What is, in, what is out there for Australia that we need to do more uh, to ensure that we get the greatest benefit for ourselves from, and indeed, for China too? Well, that, that's a very big question, but it, one of, let me answer it in a, in a couple of uh, obvious ways and perhaps a couple of less obvious ones. The first thing to say is China is a, a country with a population of 1.3 billion people. Uh, so simply going to Beijing population, 21 million, Shanghai population, 29 million, uh, and Guangzhou, uh, doesn't even get us in touch with, of course it gets us in touch with key decision makers, but there are, there are large uh, markets in other areas. The coastal provinces typically are much more developed. Just to take the province of Shandong, uh, an hour's flight from Beijing, a population of close to 100 million people, uh, sister state relationship with South Australia, a thriving port which uh, receives vast quantities of Australian iron ore, um, a growing market for the uh, clean green produce that we produce uh, for Australian wine, uh, for all of these sorts of areas for Australian services. So uh, it's a very small market if we only concentrate on the three key cities. But China's a bit like Europe in terms of its size and a bit like Europe in terms of its diversity. Uh, in Europe's case, there are countries. In China's case, there are provinces. And there are... Uh, increasing numbers of Australian companies who have a, a presence, uh, whether they're manufacturing. I'm mean, speaking to, to Blue Scope Steel this morning. Uh, if you go out to uh, Chengdu, capital of Sichuan province, 80 million people where we established a consulate general last year, you'll find an ANZ bank branch open just uh, a month ago, uh, an ANZ bank call centre. You'll see Ream there, you'll see Blue Scope there, you'll see uh, Serve Corp there, uh, you'll see a, 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 a population which is increasingly attracted to Australia. Sichuan Airlines, for example, is now flying direct between Chengdu and Melbourne uh, and via Chongqing to Sydney. So they, uh, they uh, have a very strong interest in promoting travel to Australia. You'll see uh, university to university relationships you see Australian study centres, 30 of them in universities across China. Uh, so, and you'll also see a huge amount of, uh, it's a bit hard to see this directly, but a huge amount of Australian iron ore going into steel across mills across China that are then, that is then being used to lay what, will, what is already the world's largest fast train network, which is contributing to the urbanisation of China, the growth of cities. But you'll also see a you know, cultural dimension. Um, the uh, uh, Rio Tinto has just sponsored uh, for the last 12 months a touring exhibition of art uh, from the Warburton, uh, by the Warburton community in Western Australia called Our Land, Our Body. It's been seen by over half a million people in China. 
Sydney Symphony Orchestra's touring uh, last week and this week. I'm missing their concerts. They're playing in nine cities across China. So, you know, Australia, if, you, if you want to look for Australia in China, you have to go almost everywhere. Uh, and when you do go, you find some pretty interesting things happening and a huge amount of potential for more. I have had a very good go. Now it is uh, your turn. I'm sure you have some very interesting questions for the Ambassador too. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, just to reflect on that great American president, his adage was, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, 30 years ago, we used to send Australian volunteers over to China to help lift them out of poverty. Now, they've been so successful that now we're getting afraid that China's gone too far up the social ladder. And that's a pity we don't send them over anymore. China's not regarded as a third world country. Now, uh, I, um, on that business of nothing to fear but fear itself, I think our fears are unrealistic. But that aside, having visited the memorial to the 300,000 uh, massacre, massacre of Chinese, I assume you've seen that memorial. Yeah, uh, my wife and I saw it recently. Now, Shinzo Abo's grandfather, was not necessarily responsible for that, but he was, one of the, he was in the army at the time. Uh, do you think China's fears are realistic about the rise of Japan as a military force? The question is, are China's fears about Japan realistic? Jim and I had an earlier, a conversation earlier in the day when we spoke a little bit about some of these things. And of course, the hist history between um, China and Japan as near neighbours goes back centuries. It goes back longer than centuries, actually. Uh, the answer to the question is very difficult for an outsider to give. I think you can only really understand what happens between those two countries if you are Chinese or you are Japanese. Now, clearly there's an element of fear on both sides and both can reach into very long histories to find evidence to support those fears. Um, for a country like Australia, uh, which uh, obviously has uh, been through world wars, has contributed in the way that we have to many, uh, uh, to, to many efforts around the globe in that respect. Uh, and as a young country, it's much easier for us to be able to you know, move on in the terms uh, currently used today. It's much uh, harder for us to convince others that that is necessarily what they should be doing. But I think there is a, certainly a recognition within the region, within the Asia Pacific region, that we will be a stronger region, a more prosperous region, a more peaceful region, if Japan and China can find a way because they are each other's largest trading partners. I mean, there's a huge amount going on in that relationship. But at the moment, uh, the Japanese are raising a flag about the Chinese and the Chinese are doing the same about the Japanese. All we can really do, I think, is continue to uh, encourage them. And the path will be a very long one before they are able to reach uh, the kind of sort of recon reconciliation that we would like to see. But I think we can show through our relationships with both that it's possible to, um, to develop each of those further uh, and we emphasise to both of them the need for peace. But I, I can simply say that I observe uh, on the part of both of them that what they say rings very true within their own societies. The extent to which it's objectively true, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Ambassador, I used to be a teacher in China and it was one of the most interesting parts of my life. I'm often worried about the schizophrenia we have with regards to China. We're happy to go and visit them. We're happy to have them visit us. We love trading with them. Yet at the same time, our, well, erstwhile American allies tell us that we've got to contain China. So we have Marines come here on rotation. We have extended our airways in the Northern Territory. We have greater facilities uh, now in Western Australia to service uh, ships from the American Seventh Fleet. Uh, 
Now, in reality, I don't believe that there's any empirical evidence that China is an imperialistic, aggressive nation, and yet there seems to be views politically within Australia and even more so in the United States that we want you to, we want to trade with you and do business, but we're going to uh, encircle you. Is this realistic? I don't think China, we have anything to fear from China. Well, I, I don't think that it's, that it's possible uh, to contain or encircle China. Um, I mean, that's not something that, that uh, uh, is achievable, even if we wanted to do it. Uh, and I don't think we do want to do it, actually. What we want is a peaceful region, a productive relationship. But if you look at what Australia is doing across the region in terms of developing relationships, and you know, def the defence part of it is certainly, certainly there and is happening across the region, so to a deeper political relationships. But almost every country in the Asia-Pacific region is in, in a process of further developing its defence relationships with other countries in the region. And the one part that you didn't mention that I think is relevant to our consideration of all of this is the defence relationship between Australia and China. Australia is one of only two countries which has a chief of the defence force level annual defence strategic dialogue with China for the last, and that's been going for 17 years. For the last 17 years, we have been gradually building the Australian Defence Force and the People's Liberation Army, um, practical cooperation across a whole range of areas. We were the first Western country to in, engage in live fire naval exercises with China. We were the first Western country to, uh, to undertake humanitarian assistance and disaster relief exercises with the People's Liberation Army. We are, uh, every year sees a gradual strengthening of that relationship. Each of the service chiefs, Army, Navy and Air Force from Australia, has visited China this year for discussions, and I've been present at a number of them, with their Chinese counterparts, where we have you know, very sensible discussions about uh, the overall environment in the region, the strategic environment, discussions about uh, capabilities around transparency and all sorts of things. But that's not so much a part of the discussion and debate in Australia because it doesn't quite fit that narrative. But that is what we're doing. Uh, and I, you know, I, I will say to you, as I've said to the Chinese on a number of occasions, the most likely use of uh, the rotating Marines in Darwin uh, is for deployment in some uh, humanitarian and disaster relief response with Australia. But we are continuing to work with the Chinese. There will be you know, exercises later this year that it will involve them. But it's happening across the region. And China is increasingly exercising and developing its own defence relationships, developing its own white paper, its own means of explaining all of this. And we encourage them to do that because the more the region is knowledgeable about and understands what China's military modernisation plans are, and what its intent is, the more we can concentrate on the other part of all of that, which is uh, continuing to, to grow economically and to develop prosperity. Hillary Clinton has recently warned Australia about the danger of putting all its eggs in the China basket. And indeed, with Australia's reliance on its trade with China and its exports to China, it would seem that there is indeed reliance that the Australian superannuation is reliant upon China, it would almost seem. Now, with the increasing predictions that China's growth is unsustainable, that a crash is inevitable, to what extent do you think that Australia does have too many of its eggs in the China basket? And what precautions have we taken, are we taken? to help Australia, to sustain Australia's economy in the event of a China crash? There's a question there that thinks it's more for uh, Tony Abbott than for you, but the, but the, but the other side of it, <laughs> the other side of it, the question is, is, is the point that it was raised by Hillary Clinton. We are extremely dependent on China. To what extent, I guess, if I may, um, 
how worried should we be about uh, whether uh, the growth trajectory uh, of China, which is slowing, uh, whether it is sustainable given that there are, and we know, uh, significant problems associated uh, with its way forward? Right, now, there are a lot of questions wrapped up in that. Mm. I will do my best to answer them, but Jim, please, uh, if you feel I've, I've missed something, uh, bring me back to it. Um, the words China and crash are not ones that I have ever used together, nor would I. I mean, it's, it's sensible, obviously, for us to, uh, to think deeply about China's economy, to be knowledgeable about it. It has grown for over 30 years uh, at a rate higher than 10%. It is currently growing and projected to grow at a rate of around seven, seven and a half percent. Just in terms of the maths, uh, if that is sustained, and I think there are very good reasons why it will be, uh, I mean, not without some variation from time to time, but, but 10 years of seven percent, a bit over seven percent growth, means that China's economy doubles in size every 10 years. So the growth that we're currently seeing, seven and a half percent, uh, is equivalent to about double that growth. Back in, if you go back to 2008, uh, we would have needed 14% growth in China to generate the demand that is being generated by 7% now. Now, I'm not saying the Chinese economy can't crash, but what I'm saying is the Chinese economy has very considerable potential for growth. The Chinese still regard themselves as a developing country there are still more than 100 million people below the recognised UN poverty line. Um, there is still amongst the still relatively small middle class in China, there is huge potential. I mean, whether it's 100 million or possibly 150 million at the moment, there is very substantial scope for growth. China is reorienting its own growth model for one that has been, from one that's been reliant on uh, export markets. Uh, which was the earlier model, to one which will be driven uh, increasingly by domestic consumption. Last year, for the first time, services delivered within China uh, contributed more to gross domestic product than the manufacturing sector. So that uh, rebalancing, economic rebalancing, is uh, a work in progress. It will be given further impetus by the economic reforms that were announced at the end of last year uh, and which have a horizon, really, a 10-year time horizon. So I've always been, uh, for the last 30 years, uh, of the China soft landing school uh, rather than the hard landing school, although I do think it's sensible for Australia, obviously, to, uh, to continue to develop a range of markets. Uh, the point about are we too dependent, have we got too many eggs in one basket? I mean, the fact is that the Australian economy and we Australians have benefited tremendously during a period, uh, the global financial crisis, when the rest of the world, particularly the rest of the Western world, has really struggled economically. And Australia is you know, the only, or there may be one other Western country which has had continuous economic growth for 23 years. Most people in Australia no longer remember uh, or, or, or are too young ever to have experienced a recession. And while there's been you know, a very um, high quality economic policy management in Australia during that period, it is, you know, in my mind, it's clearly the case that China's made a substantial contribution to that. Now, if you're an exporter and you're producing iron ore, for example, uh, and China's demand is there, are you going to say to yourself, I'll stop now because I don't want to be too dependent on that market. I mean, the fact is $52 billion in export receipts came to Australia last year as a result of iron ore exports to China alone. As a third, as half of our total exports, it's a third of, of total trade. And we say, you say, we're dependent. I say China is relying on Australia for over half of its imported iron ore, an absolutely crucial strategic import and import into its steel industry. So we're in this together. Uh, and as long as we're in this together in the way that we are, I am confident that it will continue to be a very productive relationship. It is the world's second largest economic entity and it's in our neighbourhood. 
So of course, we are going to be developing the kind of relationship that we have with China. If we didn't, frankly, we'd be negligent. But Australia's you know, history, geography, nat in natural endowment, there's more that we can do to spread the risk, if you like. But I, I dispute, and you possibly wanted me to dispute, uh, the fundamental premise that you put forward. Thank you, Ambassador. Pleasure to see you in Australia. Um, I'd just like to ask a question that's just perhaps a, a flip side of the, the last question. Um, you've spoken very clearly about the, uh, the depth of the relationship between Australia and China, the economic relationship, the government relationship, even the defence relationship and the people-to-people -people issues. Um, and we've got much to be proud for that. But um, the rest of the world is also you know, seeking to play the China game. And you know, on an economic front, I think over 124 nations now count China as its number one trading partner, something that we felt very proud of a few years ago in our own right. Um, do you think that Australia is working hard enough and fast enough to stay on top of the relationship and maintain the position that we're currently enjoying at the present? Thanks very much, David, and I should uh, point out to those who may not know you, David Olson was chairman of the Australian Chamber of Commerce uh, in Beijing for a number of years, has a long-standing uh, um, business in China and knowledge of it. Um, are we doing enough? Yes, I mean, it's an immensely competitive business, if you like. Um, the world is beating a path to China's door and China's leaders are very actively engaged in, in travel and developing uh, relationships. And we'll all get a sense of that, a, a perhaps a better sense of it when President Xi visits Australia for the G20 leaders meeting in November, makes a bilateral uh, visit, a state visit afterwards. I think uh, Australians will then see, will, will understand more, he'll, whether he becomes a household name or not is another matter. Uh, how do, I mean, as a government, how have we positioned ourselves in relation to China. I think a key thing, and I mentioned it uh, earlier, was the uh, strategic partnership that was agreed with China last year. Uh, on, a, on the face of it, that can mean a variety of things, but the, the key element of it, the really beneficial part of it, was that we established what's called an annual leaders meeting dialogue, a mechanism with China. China has such a formal mechanism only with a handful of other countries, uh, with Russia, uh, with Germany, with France. It took two years of patient diplomacy to achieve that. And what that means now is that Premier Li Keqiang and our Prime Minister sit down together once a year uh, in a formal structured setting with uh, officials on both sides having prepared months in advance uh, to, uh, to take our, you know, ways in which we can take our relationship forward announceable such as last year's around direct trading between the Australian dollar and the Chinese currency, the renminbi. Beneath that overarching construct, we've agreed a foreign and strategic dialogue led by foreign ministers on both sides, also on an annual basis, and a strategic economic dialogue, uh, which was held for the first time in Beijing last week when Joe Hockey as treasurer and Andrew Robb as minister for trade and investment uh, went to Beijing together and, and sat down and uh, with the National Development and Reform Commission Chairman Xu Shu. Now, we can't, having achieved that, we can't sort of sit back and say we've done that because it is a competitive business. We need to use those opportunities every year. We need to be very focused, not just as an embassy, not just as a, as a, uh, as a government bureaucracy at the federal level, but we need to do this in a very comprehensive, joined up way to ensure that uh, we can advance Australia's interests, both in terms of the opportunities, but also in terms of some of the perhaps difficult conversations that we need to have uh, from time to time. Both sides want to do this from time to time about things that worry us. So, you know, we can't let up. I think we're holding our own. Um, I think we're doing reasonably well in some areas, but we can always do better. And that's one of the reasons I'm travelling the country now is to talk to people about what we should be doing, what we should be doing next to build on uh, the achievements that uh, have been made possible so far. Good evening, Ambassador. My name's Rebecca Cass and I'm the CEO of the Committee for Geelong. You might have seen maybe on Monday evening that Q&A came to Geelong. We were very pleased that our great city was highlighted to live to the nation. We do have largely business members of our organisation and 
uh, given, uh, as it was highlighted by Q&A on Monday evening, that uh, Geelong is going through a bit of a transformation at the moment. The feedback that we're receiving from some of our members is that particularly uh, there are businesses and investors in China who are starting to a little, be a bit little wobbly uh, about their investments, largely in Geelong. So given your expertise, what would be your advice for Victoria's second largest city to really advertise to China and its investors that Geelong is, is a, an okay place to invest? Well, thank you very much indeed for the question, and I, I apologise. I'm a, a fan of Q&A. Q&A came to China once. I try and watch it when I can, but I was speaking to an audience in Brisbane on Monday night, but I'll, I'll make a point of catching it on, on uh, replay. Um, the relationship, I mean, there, there, is, there are parts of re regional Australia which have a substantial stake in the China relationship, and obviously, you know, for Geelong, uh, you are uh, already going through a, a, a period of, of, uh, of adjustment and, and ultimately, we all hope, transformation. But the particular issue that you raised is, and it sort of links with what Jim and I were talking about earlier, only about a month ago, I visited uh, Jiangxi province, which is uh, a central Chinese province. Uh, it was one that I hadn't been to before, but I knew the party secretary and uh, Austrade, which is very sort of active for Australia in developing uh, trade and investment partnerships, uh, arranged for me to meet uh, two local vehicle manufacturers, one of them called Bonluck Buses and the other called the uh, Jiangling Motor Corporation. In discussions with both of them, it became clear to me that they are already sourcing some componentry. In the case of Bonluck Buses, they're actually sourcing steel from Australia for the buses that they then export back to Australia. They've got about a 20% share of the bus market in Australia. Um, but they know that for countries like Australia and other developed countries using Australian steel uh, enables them to uh, pass the, the quality tests, the assurance tests that they need to. But it wasn't just about steel, it was about components, about seats and seat belts. And, uh, at the, the uh, Jung, Jungling Bus Corporation, uh, Motor Corporation, it was about components that they, some of which they're already sourcing from Australia. They know Australia well, they've been working with us for a while, but as a result of that conversation, uh, they agreed during a visit to Australia that they were already planning to visit Geelong to, uh, to hold meetings with, which Australia's in the process of organising, uh, local component manufacturers because the global vehicle supply chain, if you like, is, is changing. And it makes a lot of sense they realise, I was quite struck by this because I hadn't realised it, that it makes a lot of sense to them not to source, obviously, whole vehicles in Australia, not to make whole vehicles in China, but to bring the components where we do make well, where we have a comparative advantage, where we have um, uh, re registration, recognition, certification, across developed country markets to use those because to start from scratch in those certification processes is something that takes a long time and is very expensive. So I wouldn't want to overstate uh, what that might mean, but what, it, what did strike me is that there is real potential for, which we're now going to try and explore in more detail, uh, to try and link what is a a global driver of automotive production and, and indeed demand, domestic demand in China for cars is just of all kinds is going like this, with parts of Australia that have particular skills and expertise, not only in manufacturing, but also in, in design, also in a number of the uh, aspects of, of um, producing, developing testing, safety testing vehicles that we do well. So, that's probably the best answer that I can give at this stage, but let me just say you're very much on our radar. Ambassador, this has been very interesting indeed. Uh, China is such a huge place and of such importance to Australia that I wish we could go on for much longer. Unfortunately, I have a television program to present <laughs> a little bit later in the evening and I know the Ambassador has a very busy schedule too. So. I fear that uh, we will have to leave it there for now. We appreciate your expertise, your insights and the candour with which you have dealt with these questions. I appreciate it. I'm sure all of you do too.
Ambassador, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I must say, from my point of view, it's been um, a real privilege um, to sit in and participate on such a fascinating conversation, which has been so broad-ranging into the future of China, uh, China's foreign policy, Australia's relations with China. It's been a real privilege to be here tonight um, to join in this uh, conversation that the two of you have led. And I'd like to, uh, just to reiterate uh, my great appreciation and thanks uh, to both of you uh, for joining us uh, tonight in this conversation. Her Excellency, Ms. Frances Adamson, our uh, Ambassador to China and the ABC's uh, Jim Middleton. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>